is on okay good hi everyone and welcome here and thank you for joining us at this talk at the Cirque design fridge festival here in the design museum we'll be talking today about the invisible stakeholders because as designers have you ever considered who is affected by the designs that you create beyond the customer that you were designing for and in your thoughts can you think of a project that you once finished which you've seen the ripple effects just afterwards, the good and the bad consequences, maybe even beyond the context of the business and the customer you were designed for. That's what we'd like to reflect on today. And we'd like to share our thoughts on how we think we should design in order to create inclusive, responsible design. So how can we use sustainable design to include these invisible stakeholders that we often forget when we start designing for a customer? So we have walked through five topics during this talk. The first one being, why is it key for serious design to consider sustainability? The second one being, how do surface design and sustainable design methodologies combine? The third one being, how did we embed um, serious design into our design agency and the ways we're working? The fourth one is, how we engage our clients in considering sustainability? And the fifth one is, how do we show the value to businesses of the value of including these invisible stakeholders and designing for them as well? But before we start on the topic, I'd like first to introduce ourselves, Eva Saren. We are from a design agency based here in London, in Shoreditch, and we're about 200 people focusing on customer-centric design, a design services, products, and helping our clients in customer-led transformation. We work for global clients such as GSK, Vodafone, and HSBC, and we have over 20 years experience in product and service design, with an additional specialisms in business design, development, research, and storytelling. We are part of the EY family, which means that we can focus on the front-end development, creating these customer experiences, thinking about propositional design. And then we've got EY who can support our clients in the event and build of these services. So here at EY Seren, we're a bunch of very motivated service designers coming from various different backgrounds, sharing the passion to create great experiences and services. But some of us also share another passion, which is sustainability. And we spend so much time together, half of the time that we are awake, we are at work. And we thought, hey, we should do more than just doing great projects. We should do and try to incorporate sustainability into the work that we do. So a bunch of us started thinking about this. And the team grew and grew and is now reaching over all of the levels of our company. And today here, representing the team, is the three of us. I am Lee and I'm a service designer and I'm going to be talking about the theory of sustainability and how we incorporate it into the projects that we have. Well, hey everyone, I'm Serge. I'm a rogue business designer, not quite a service designer. But I'll be talking about the thing that business designers all love, which is value. How do we demonstrate sustainable value to our clients, to our organizations, and then enable that to, for the organizations to transform into more positive outcomes. And I'm Louisa, I'm a service designer just like Lee, and I'll be showing reflection on the services that are out there in today's world, and showing you how we embedded sustainability into our agency and our journey towards that. So let's start with a reflection of today's world. In the Western world, service design has empowered businesses to consider customer needs and customer expectations, which enable them to offer the right services and products that respond to people's wishes and maybe even beyond that. So let's have a look at three examples here. The first one being an example in the food industry. So we service designers have enabled people to have food as a service. So we deliver the convenience for a few clicks on your phone to get food delivered to your door through a service such as Deliveroo. Then if you look in the financial industry, we have enabled people to get easier on the property ladder. So we enabled customers to get a mortgage loan more easily, and therefore more and more people could buy a house. And if you look at the third example in the telecom industry, 
we see that people wish to have this instant access to the internet, to be always connected and to also have access to the online services that we've created as service designers as well. And therefore, we came up with telecom providers to create these unlimited data packages so they can have that instant access that we were asking for. This seems all very ideal in the context that you are designing for, designing for a business and their customers. But actually, if you look at the bigger context, we see also major drawbacks in the services that were created. If we look at the food platform, such as Deliveroo, we see that in order to bring that convenience, the delivery needs to be at maximum efficiency, which means that deliver ha deliverers have to operate at maximum efficiency. So their fee is actually based on the locations that they deliver and the speed that they deliver it. And based on that, maybe if you're in a traffic jam as a deliverer, you need to consider do I have the risk in being paid lower than living wage, or do I take the risk for my life in order to get food delivered in time? If we look at the second example in the, in the financial industry, what we see that is maybe we overestimated what we could deliver to people. Because giving all these loans and mortgage offers resulted in a housing collapse, uh, or a collapse of the housing market in 2008, and therefore a global financial crisis. So that results actually in victims, innocent victims of the system, such as people who are working for an employer who got bankrupt as a result of the global crisis, or people who couldn't afford their loan anymore because of the collapse of the housing market, and then got homeless as a result. And then in the third example, if you look at this offer of unlimited data in the telecom industry, it seems our idea of giving people anything they wish for. But actually, giving that access to the internet and having these online services and giving them all this data uh, online results in 10% of the world's energy consumption nowadays, expected to increase to 20% in only five years' time. Imagine all the air pollution caused by this, this demand that we created. And imagine the use of finite internet energy services required in order to respond to this demand. And now, there are some solutions out there. We're considering, for example, in the fast fashion industry, maybe we could think about rental clothing, but do we then actually address the real problem that's out there? So, looking at all of these examples, we took a step back and thought, what are the underlying problems from that? What are the issues that service design is facing that is showing in these examples? And we came up with two main issues. The first one is the accelerated consumption. Our job is to help businesses grow and to create value for them and to make them competitive in the market. And we create services that are super accessible, 24-7, everywhere, all the time, overnight delivery, food, food delivery, whatever you can imagine. But with that, we accelerate the system, we accelerate the tempo at which these, system, uh, these services are being consumed. And that is not in sync with the system that is creating the resources that we're consuming. So a tree is not going to grow faster just because we chop it down faster. And the second one is we have become too user-centered. It's great that we put the human or like the user at the center, but it has become to an extent where we can only see the user as the consumer of our services. And we forget that they are also representing society or that they represent the whole planet. And so we have decided that we want to start looking at the invisible stakeholder. And what we understand under the invisible stakeholder is all of the people and all of the elements that are impacted by our design decisions. And that can be humans that we don't just don't consider. For example, the livelihood of delivery drivers that we mentioned before. But it can also be nature and the planet, <laughs> planets that we're damaging and causing harm. So knowing all of this, we at UICR thought we want to do something about this. And we want to become more sustainable. And we decided we want to become sustainable service designers. <laughs> But with that, we entered the jungle. 
I don't know how you feel about that, but we, when we started to look at sustainability, were pretty overwhelmed. And we thought, mm, we have to put a bit of structure into that before we can actually start incorporating it into the work that we do. And we did some research around what do we understand as service design. And the first question is around what is sustainability in the first place. So a quick question into the audience. Which one of these buildings do you think is the most sustainable one? Who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? And who thinks it's D? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so the answer to that question is it depends. Because it depends <laughs> what you measure in sustainability. A, the pyramid, is the most sustainable one because it's the one that lasts for the longest. If you measure longevity, it's the most sustainable one. B, the jungle hut is the most sustainable one because the moment that you stop using it, or the moment that you stop, stop yeah, using it, um, it will go back to the ecosystem that it was created from. And C is the most sustainable one because it's the most adaptive one. A child's hut is, if the ch when the child develops and has new needs, the child's hut very easily adapts to these new needs. Then the next problem that we face is that Sustainable, the term sustainable has become equal to doing good. And just yesterday I was reading The Economist and every other ad was somehow referencing the term sustainability. It has become the buzzword, it is so vague, it, it includes everything and nothing at the same time. And because we're all trying to do good, it becomes, it becomes impossible to differentiate and nobody wants to be the bad guy except for Billie Eilish. <laughs> Another issue is that there's so much information out there. There's so many articles, everyone has their own standpoint, and it's impossible to make an informed decision because it's so incredibly complex. And there's so much data and viewpoints out there that it's just to make decisions with all of that information at hand becomes really, really difficult. <coughs> Then the question around what do you measure? Do you measure how easily degradable it is? Do you measure how much water is used to produce an item? Do you measure how much CO2 emission? Do you measure the carbon footprint? And what is it that you, that you measure? The question around time. Do you consider a time frame of a century? Or do you consider a time frame of just a couple of years that you consider sustainable? And that is especially interesting when we talk about service design, which is not made to last for a century. And then the last one, the question to in relation to what? Because taking the train is more sustainable than flying, but to not travel in the first place would be the most sustainable one. But that's usually not really the option because you don't have the output. So with all of that knowledge at hand, we thought, oh, again, we need to clarify, we need to think about how we want to do that in a, in a more strategic way. And in our team, we decided that we want to base our implementation of uh, sustainability and service design on two frameworks, two existing frameworks, which is systems thinking and regenerative design. And so for the first one, systems thinking, Danella Meadows, who is one of the very key players in <coughs> systems thinking, says that a system is a set of things, people, cells, molecules, or whatever, interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. So a system consists of some sort of nodes, elements, things that are connected to each other and that have feedback loops that in impact how the other node behaves. And there's leverage points in the system that allow you to start shaping the system and moving the system. And the benefit of start thinking about systems when we do design is that we start to acknowledge that we work in a dynamic world. We don't work in something that is static. We can't just stop the world from turning and do our design. And the second thing is that 
we acknowledge that cause and effect is not something linear. It's something that is a lot more complex, but by acknowledging that, we, a lot of new opportunities open up. And I know that I'm only scratching on the surface, and I think Noor can, I don't know, congratulations if she's in here, um, can confirm that. And there's a lot of other talks happening at the French Festival um, regarding uh, systems thinking. So if you are interested in that, please have a look at that. And there's a beautiful example from nature around what a system is and why it makes so much sense to start thinking in systems. Thanks, Lee. So, just to base it a bit more in kind of reality, just a quick hands up. Anybody been to Yellowstone National Park in the US? <coughs> a couple of hands. Um, some of you may know this story I'm about to tell, but really shows you the power of systems and the importance of time and understanding all those connections. So, picture yourself a service designer in the 1920s. You're in charge of this park and you want to increase customer satisfaction because you realize your NPS score is, well, it's a business. It's basically minus 100. Why wolves keep eating all your customers? <laughs> Not the most customer-centric thing. So what do you do? 1920s, you don't really understand your impact. You get rid of that pain point, um, and you get rid of all the wolves. But what happens then? So what happened was, without this apex predator, the deer and elk population shot up. Now you think, okay, that's fine. A few more grass-eating herbivores, what's the worst that can happen? Well, these grass-eating herbivores started going down to the valleys, um, the general hunting grounds of the wolves, and without the predator there, started eating everything. They ate all the grass, then they started eating the saplings, the growing trees, and the shrubs. Fast forward uh, 40, 50, 60 years, and the valleys now are desolate. The rivers are raging in straight lines through them and washing everything away. So the decision was done in 1995 to reintroduce wolves bit by bit to see what would happen. And it was an amazing and almost in, well, instantaneous uh, outcome. With the introduction of wolves, the deer and elk suddenly decided not to go to the valleys and get eaten. And through that, saplings were able to grow. Um, cottonwood, aspen, willow trees started sprouting up. With the trees returning, songbirds return, about five times as many songbirds as before. With more trees um, protecting the soil, shrubs and berries grew, so small mammals could return. And because of the small mammals, eagles returned. Because of the berries, bears returned. Suddenly, this one um, node in the system, this apex predator, was able to impact the whole ecosystem. And through not only that, um, the very landscape of Yellowstone Park, because with the strengthened soil from the trees and the shrubs, rivers slowed down. They started to meander more. <coughs> Through that, another bioengineer returned, which was the beaver. So this concept in nature and biology is called the trophic cascade, where um, the addition of a top predator has a reciprocal change throughout the whole system. Now, why is this important to us? Well, we as designers need to consider this concept. Where are the feedback loops? Where are the nodes that we have an impact on? And to put it another way, where are the leverage points? Um, as good old Archimedes said, with a big enough stick, you can move the world. So as designers, we need to be conscious that our actions and our designs will have a huge impact through systems that, as Lee mentioned, may take a lot of time to actually see um, and feedback throughout the whole system. The next, the other, the other framework that we like to base our um, design from is regenerative design, which addresses the question, what are we actually sustaining with sustainability? Because sustainability seems to be only the zero-sum game, but it's not actually doing any good. It's just keeping it at like the ground level. And um, the question with that is then, how can we as designers kind of do more? How can we do the reverse of the damage that we're causing? And regenerative design is all about thinking ahead. It's all about thinking about how can we do more good than just not doing any harm. And another good example from nature is the following. So locusts, not the uh, greatest pet, but a tasty snack for some. When they get into big enough swarms, they are effectively a biblical plague, eating everything in their path. 
Now, just conceptually, just think about this. Here is an entity that consumes and has to move on. It cannot sustain itself. Um, growth is the only answer, but the energy required for that growth can never be accomplished. Contrast locusts with bees. Bees live within their ecosystem and actually contribute back to it. They don't just um, take pollen and create honey, they cross-pollinate. They um, help plants grow, they provide sustenance to other animals as well. So the concept here really is then, in the way that we design, can we stop thinking as, as locusts for just inputs and outputs and having a specific outcome, to thinking about the system that we're operating in and helping regenerate it, as Lee said. Can we also then start applying this to businesses? Can we move from one to another perspective? So then thinking about, well, these theoretical frameworks are good, but how do we actually then start implementing it into the everyday work that we do? So we, our team designed four principles to help us think about sustainability when we work, which is to have a defined vision, to know your system, to play to your strength, and to generate value beyond the outcome. And we'll have a look at all of them. So the first one, to have a defined vision is around what is your definition of sustainability in context? The challenge that this addresses is what I mentioned in the beginning, that sustainability is just such a vague term and we don't really know how to act within that. And the value that you get from having a defined vision and to define sustainability in context is that you kind of cut it down and to make the term sustainability very precise and concrete to the environment that you're working in. And to create a vision or like to, to define what sustainability is for you and where you want to head, you don't need to start from scratch There's existing frameworks that help a lot. For example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so what we have been doing is that we looked at all of the sub-targets that the UN Sustainable Development Goals have and then we looked at, we as EY Seren, as the design agency we are, which one are the targets that we can actually have a big impact on? Where does it make sense to start pushing and nudging the system? And then when we go into a project, we can cut it down even further and see, with this particular client, in this particular time frame, what are the targets or what is the targets that we can um, work with? And this is a very good tool to have in the beginning when you start laying out the project, when you plan a project to see where your vision for the outcome of that project can be. The second one is to know your system, which addresses what are you trying to cause, for whom or what or where. And the challenge is, as before mentioned with the system and um, with the examples that we had at the very beginning, is the unintended consequences that we do, or that we have as service designers with our design decisions. And to start considering the system in a wider way, we can start seeing what the mechanisms are, and we can see who else would be impacted by what we are creating newly. A very beautiful example of this is the annual review of public health, which is around solving homelessness from a complex system perspective. And this system gets me really excited. I think it's super beautiful. So they started with mapping out what are the people, the stakeholders who are somehow impacted by homelessness. With that understanding, what are the feedback loops? What is happening in the system? What is enhancing and enabling things to happen? And then from that, understanding the mechanisms behind it. And they, they also drew a map around the feedback loops to see what is impacting which element, which node. And what they found out is to get people out of homelessness, it's actually more impactful to focus on not getting people into homelessness in the first place instead of trying to get them out. But that was an insight they only gained from mapping out the things and from understanding the context and the system that they were operating. And that is, as Noah mentioned before, that is a very good tool to use instead of or additionally or impacting, for example, journey maps. So getting away from just a very linear way of thinking about things into a more systemic way of understanding things. The third one is around playing to your strength. What strengths do you have? 
and where can you apply them? And this is around, so in sustainability it happens quite often that we do this huge effort with actually quite a small impact. And how can we shift from that to doing very little but having a massive impact? And this is around thinking about the existing movements, the existing dynamics, and using them to your advantage instead of going the other way and trying to stop it. And a beautiful example from that is are the half houses in Chile by Elemental. And how many of you know that example? Just out of curiosity. Okay, um, so in Chile there was a massive earthquake and the livelihood of a whole neighborhood was at danger. And then Elemental came in, they were asked to rebuild the houses that were destroyed by the earthquake. And they, they realized that if they build new houses, new shiny houses, the people who used to live there could no longer afford to live there. And they would have to move out of the city where they could afford to live, but then they would lose their livelihood because they can't travel into the city for, to get to work. And so what they did, they researched and they actually found out that the people that live there, they're very talented and they know how to build all of these things. And all that they need is a basic house structure and a bit of electricity and the plumbing, but they can do the best. So what Elemental came up with is this idea of a very basic house and whenever the people had a bit of additional money, they could build their own house. And with that they made use of the local knowledge and skills that the people had. And this is a way of thinking about, in, for example, ideation sessions. What are the existing knowledge that we have access to? And the last one is value beyond outcome, which is around what does your design solution help to regenerate? That's based on the regenerative design. So thinking around moving a bit further away, having a bit wider understanding of what is it that you're trying to achieve and not just thinking of the immediate benefits that you have to your customer and your consumer but what is it in the bigger picture that you're trying to solve what is it that you're trying to help regenerate for society or for the planet and an example from this is Dell's net positive approach which is by 2020 the goods that will come from our technology will be 10 times what it takes to create and use it and i really like that such a big company starts thinking in a different way and starts trying to create more goods that goes beyond just the sustainability, just, just the zero sum. And so with these four principles, with having a vision, knowing your system, playing to your strength, and create value beyond outcome, we want to create better services. And there's an example from our own work. Yes, so as Lee said, a quick demonstration of one of our projects where you apply these principles. So the client was working, is based in the financial industry and it's a building society who came to us because they were losing clients, because they didn't offer a digital channel for them to look into their savings accounts and mortgage accounts. So they came to us and they said, we'd like to have this digital channel for our members, but how can we keep that building society feeling or vision into this digital environment. So that's when we started looking at the vision. So what is sustainability in that context? And if you look at a building society, it actually is already quite sustainable. So they help people to save more money and in return they offer better mortgage offers to other people in their community. So we thought actually they're helping people prosper in their lives. Can we focus on financial literacy? Then we started looking at their system and we discovered two important elements of it. One of it being the local community, because a building society doesn't have shareholders. Anything that a profit that they make is reinvested either into the building society or invested in businesses in the local community. The other important element is families, because this brand is passed on for generations. Any grandchildren, parents in the community that get new grandchildren open a savings account for them. And that connects it all together. So what is then the strength? And then we come back to actually the staff in the branches of this building society because they offer branches in every high street in their local area. And this 
is where everything comes together. This is where they deliver the service to the families. This is where they deliver the service to the community. So what we did is when we created this digital environment, we created a platform where the staff can organize educational events to help people save more, to help them understand things. And we thought, how can we give back to this community in addition to that? And that's where we thought, well, let's create a concept of family saving where people or families can have a shared goal on saving. So we help parents to instill the children good savings behaviors. And when we looked at the businesses in the local community, we thought that the concept to set up a platform where members can sponsor to these businesses or even do volunteering work. So we bring that community aspect together and it's more than just a way to access a savings or mortgage account. So that's one way to look at it. How do we embed sustainability in the work that we're doing? But also, we also need to consider how we embed sustainability in ourselves, into our design agency and the ways we work with for each other. So that's when we started to connect with colleagues, started talking about it into our organization. And we very quickly run into three major <coughs> challenges. The first one being, actually our client is not asking for it at the moment. Clients come to us because they have seen a different need from customers lately or because they find it difficult to compete in the market that they're in. The second challenge is our design agency is not known for sustainable design. We're known as the digital agency that does customer transformations. And then there's the third one being our colleagues gave us a lot of positive feedback on this sustainability initiative. and. They were very enthusiastic about it, but they were also new to the idea. So they were wondering how do we then embed that into our work and how do we understand what it means for us and the ways we work. So we started with the last challenge, um, helping our colleagues to understand what sustainability is and what it means in their work. So we organized educational workshops where we showed different sustainability methods, such as the Iceberg Model Canvas and the Planet Centric Design Tool. Um, so both will share at the end with the sources, so you can look them up yourself if you're interested. Um, and not only give, did we give our colleagues an opportunity to look at them, but we also received feedback from them, whether they saw these methods being used in projects, or what elements they think could work, and which less. And then there's the challenge we're not known as a design agency for it. So we've had support from a leadership team and we embedded three values aligned to our strategy as design agency that are aligned with sustainability as well and what it means for us as a design agency. So we'd like to have three values, we have three values uh, having a positive impact on the environment, having a positive impact into, for individuals such as the employees I was talking about, and having that positive impact on the society and future of society. For example, with the, uh, oh, sorry, with the uh, Billy Society example. And then there was this one challenge left, which is it's not our client's priority. So how do we actually show the value and engage our clients in considering? So in an ideal world, we would identify sustainability as a good opportunity for them to address the problem that they have. For example, there is a governmental policy that's changing that they need to address, or customers have become more interested in a sustainability solution or service that they could offer. And then it would be us proposing sustainable design, considering invisible stakeholders. They would see the value in it, and we would tell and start a project. That sounds ideal, right? But in reality, there are different contexts, there are different client needs, so there are different ways that we have to show what the value actually is in doing that. For example, client stakeholders may have short-term goals. It may have that they have to look at the onboarding of the service that they have, and they need to hit a certain sales target by the end of the year. So what do you do then? Then we suggest we start a related project to help them looking at that service. But in the meantime, we'd like to show and share with them what sustainability is and what sustainability is in the ways we're working and what it could mean for them. So we help them consider what sustainability actually means over time instead of having the front and 
uh, sort of decision point for them at the beginning. You show them over time what it means and then engage them into it. And that can be very simple. It can be as simple as a journey map. We have a journey map workshop where you have sustainability in this, where you can consider with the clients if we would make this surface more stable, what would it actually mean, what were kind of what we need to change within the business, and it would it make it more engaging and have a bit more of a discussion. So that's the first leverage point that we think we can have in conversations with clients. It's showing the value over time. Now, as I said, there are multiple contexts. Another context could be that our client finds it difficult to compete in the market and is trying to have a competitive offer, or maybe they want to review and innovate on the services and products that they have. But maybe sustainability just doesn't seem to align with their strategy, so how do we then help them see the value in that case? And that is what we think where we can identify sustainability as an opportunity in the market, and then have a look at how you can align that with the value proposition. And now that sounds quite imaginary. So here's an example of what that could look like. This is a um, campaign from German Rail, and German Rail has a lot of competition with the flight industry because people, when they choose their holiday destinations, easily take the flight. And what German Rail discovers is that when people select their holiday destinations, they base it on social media. What do you see out there? What do influencers do? Where do your friends go? What can you post yourself? So that's how they pick their holiday destinations and that was what Jeremy Real identified as well. So what they did is they found uh, in pictures of international landmarks and they matched them with the same scenery experiences but then close to home. <coughs> And they then showed the real-time price differences. Actually, what you guys see is way more attractive for people to go to close to home and to save a lot of money in that way. So that's that's a very competitive offer compared to the flight industry. But at the same time, they also help you to lower your carbon footprint traveling because with this destination closer to home, you can have that same experience as you would have if you would fly to the other side of the world. Great. Thanks, Lisa. So the last section, um, we identified a couple of opportunities or points in discussions with clients. And by clients, we don't just mean external clients. It could be within your own organization um, to consider, consider how that change might happen there. But the next question really is, how do we actually then enable businesses to transform? We talked about growth, but growth up till now has always been kind of an outlook mindset. How can we shift it towards a more regenerative form of growth? But before we do that, we really just need to, again, following our principles, understand what is a business. Um, obviously, there'll be different types of businesses, but one definition at its core is that a business is there to exchange goods and services for other goods and services or for money. So here's a really important concept now around money and value. And when we think about that transformation journey and how can we align businesses to be more sustainable, this is gonna be a key lever around how can we demonstrate value and sustainability, and then how can we align them behind that and actions. Now, this uh, definition isn't exactly um, groundbreaking. It's the business dictionary. It's not the most credible of sources. But it got me thinking as well then, if this is the purpose of businesses, who does it serve? Who ultimately benefits from businesses in society as it stands right now? Well, a very important question as well, because you need to understand your actors. The key benefits are, as defined by the Business Roundtable, which is the biggest group of the largest businesses in the US. Companies such as Walmart, Boeing, uh, J&J, all sit on this. And they, they used to see, uh, key point here, that the paramount duty of management and the board of directors is to corporation stockholders, or shareholders for the UK audience. Now, this has really bred a very short-term view because shareholders are all about that growth, about that bottom line. And you know, it's not difficult to imagine though, if we continue on the path that we are, where we'll be. And I think one way to sum this up, this focus on just satisfying shareholder uh, value beyond anything else, is done by Tom Toro from the New Yorker in this lovely little cartoon. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it always cracks me up as well. Um, it really encapsulates that point, I think, that we're trying to get here. So how do we then get shareholders to think about beyond themselves? How do we um, demonstrate the value of sustainability? And how do we shift that tanker um, towards more sustainable growth? Sounds like a very difficult question, um, but it's not an impossible task. We as designers have actually cracked this nut before. Originally, as we always said, businesses were always focused on the bottom line, but suddenly they started thinking a bit differently. Um, design thinking became a phrase. Customer centricity, human-centered design, all came into, um, into the lexicon of businesses. And we, as service designers, as product designers, designers in general, were able to shift that mentality from a business only focused on growth to one that's actually also focused on customers. To be customer-centric means to align your business around that concept. So we were able to, one, do that, and we were able to do it by also demonstrating the value of being customer-centric. And as a business designer, I do love a bit of maths and a bit of finance. So as a, as a reason for why uh, being customer-centric is important for businesses, it helps you grow faster. CAGR, compound annual growth rate, just means every year you're growing 17 times more than, uh, percent more than you were the previous year. Customer centricity makes customers buy from you more. It creates better um, engagement. It builds loyalty so that if you do mess up, they will forgive you. And also it aligns employees. Um, the workforce becomes happier because they have a good purpose, they feel good about themselves, and are able to identify issues within the business and fix them. So how can we expand this uh, empathy circle from just being customer-centric to all the different stakeholders, um, to the invisible stakeholders that we keep on mentioning throughout today? Well, the first step is demonstrating that businesses should care about this. And luckily, um, somebody's already crunched the mass and there is a lot of value in being sustainable focus. Three, well, twelve trillion dollars and hundreds of millions of jobs um, can be created for shifting onto a more sustainable growth agenda. But that's great, right? We can demonstrate the value, but how do we go about it? So this is where um, EY, in partnership with the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism, has developed a framework, just one of many tools, but one that we think is really useful in shifting that mindset and really helping to make invisible stakeholders visible and intangible value tangible to shareholders and everyone else. And we call that the long-term value framework. Now, some of the designers might gawk at the, uh, the, the diagram, uh, a lot of information there, but at its crux, the point is, if you can design the metrics and you can make the invisible visible to the business, you can then understand its impact on its stakeholders and therefore align its capabilities, its tools and strengths that it uses to create value or protect it um, around that and therefore shift their strategy. <coughs> so quickly rushing through this, so we have some time for questions for Luisa Lee myself. Um, not too dissimilar from our principles. It's very important to understand the business uh, strategy, its purpose, the context that within which it exists. You need to then map your stakeholders, the impact that you're having, um, exploring all the levers in the business, how it creates value, how it protects it, how it might actually destroy value currently, and then finally uh, measuring those uh, metrics. And again, to make the intangible tangible a bit, how we think about that. So there's four main pillars around this, around the stakeholders and the value to them. One is talent. So the talent within your organization. How, as a um, consumer products company, are you structuring your business, and is it creating the right culture within it? How can you measure that? Employee satisfaction. Are your employees healthy if at a mining company? How can you measure that? Proportion of employees potentially um, practicing uh, best of practice wellness routines, such as meditation, very popular right now, but being part of a health plan, things like that. Innovation and consumer trends, don't need to talk too much about this. This is bread and butter for service design and designers around what's the innovation culture in the business? How are you actually generating consumer trust through uh, a trust indication score? And what's your impact to your consumer or society's health uh, and where you're operating? 
as Lee described, society and environment and other pillar around the sustainable development goals. So a lot of metrics exist there that you can apply to the business and to its strategy. Um, and finally, governance. How is your business being led? How does it actually communicate with regulators, with governments, with the public? Um, you can measure that through, well, that's one of the hardest ones, if we're being honest. Still, a lot is being done here, but honest publication of board minutes and how your strategy is aligning and how you're behaving against it, honest publication of anti-bribery or corruption charges and how you're responding to that. That then feedbacks in into your employee morale, into your consumer morale as well. So as we, just to come to the end of it now, um, we've really shown you two frameworks here. The long-term value framework and kind of the principles we have ourselves. The principles are very much a push um, tool from bottom up thinking about the projects and the work that you're doing and creating that change on the ground. The long-term value framework is that larger piece uh, of engaging industries and businesses and shifting their perspective into understanding that there's wider benefits if they expand uh, their viewpoint. And really the concept here is then to move away from what's called shareholder capitalism and that viewpoint of just the shareholder to stakeholder capitalism. Understanding that our capitalist system can then function with all the stakeholders being part of that and recognizing the impact that we're having to them as well. Is this possible? <laughs> Still to say. There is a lot of change going on already, from the largest brands focusing on developing sustainable products to the lovely looking man on, on over my left shoulder here is Larry Fink, who is in charge of BlackRock. Now BlackRock, I checked yesterday, actually now has $6.8 trillion under management. For that amount of money, um, BlackRock could buy out Japan and have spare change for Switzerland left. So there's a lot that Larry and the BlackRock team influence. And now if he himself is talking about the fact that if we don't realign how we're focusing um, and not include stakeholders within our approaches, we are bound to stumble and fail going forward. And really to see how mentality is changing here, if we remember the business roundtable, um, the most powerful businesses in the US, they've also changed their perspective. They've also recognized that at the end of the day, Businesses are there to serve all their stakeholders. Customers, employees, suppliers, and shareholders as well. So, there's a lot there, but just as a wrap up for everyone in the room, if we do have time for some questions. Um, we talked about issues that exist right now and how and we design services around how in some cases, we're accelerating consumption and causing negative impact to stakeholders. And by being too customer and user focused, we forget about all the other people, entities, organisms that we impact through our design decisions. We talked about our principles and Sarah about how we can actually embed that into the service design approach and how we can um, change the way we think uh, and have an impact. We talked about some of the struggles internally that we have as an agency of overcoming these and how we actually engage in our clients as well. And finally, we finished off with a framework for taking this to a much grander scale and thinking about how we can change the conversations from being purely outcome focused to being more inclusive um, of all the stakeholders out there. So from myself, Louisa, and Lee, thank you all. Uh, we've been Levi Seren, and if we do have time for questions, we'd like to ask, what are your experiences embedding sustainability into service design? How can we or should we do it? Or have you got any questions for what we just went through? And while you have a think, here are some of the resources we mentioned. So if you do want to uh, take a photo and go to the later, feel free. Thank you all.
and which is great we touched on kind of this kind of uh, returning profit to shareholders as being like this kind of bedrock of where they've been exposed to they've got this nice sustainability goal that is often the kind of key driver of why an organization exists and i wonder if you yeah have had any conversations with existing organizations or emerging companies that are looking at other legal structures like cooperatives or other ways to kind of embed and bake in all those kind of stakeholders like people and planet mm. in the kind of core essence of you know, the legal framework yeah, um, I think I'll be honest in saying that neither of us three have actually done that, uh, per se. But as an organization, definitely. Um, governance is one of the key main pillars, and part of governance is the legal frameworks and how that can be changed. Um, so, yeah, there is, there is a team that definitely looks on after that. But in addition to that, I think part of our journey as well, um, EY has a partnership with B Labs and also helping them understand how they can then scale that and embed that into part of like the methodology that we have as well. Any more questions? Okay. Thanks so much for um, your presentation. It's really, really interesting what you guys are doing. Um, I've, do, I've done some research on service design sustainability and one of the things we've done is developed a um, service design sustainable uh, blueprint. Um, and I guess the aim there was to look at the evaluation of what you're doing in, as a service designer. And I guess the question for me, I don't know, there's lots of issues with that, <laughs> just you know, bringing things together like that. But I guess the question is, how do you um, bring in these um, loops, feedback loops into your work? And what kind of things do you do to evaluate the impact of your work in terms of long term um, rather than short term? As, as in, just, just to clarify, as in we as an internal team to try to embed it into the work that we do, or? Okay. Um, no. <laughs> I think an important part of this is keep people involved. So we organize these workshops. We also ask them while they're on the project, how is it working out? Have you considered this method? How is it? Is it working or not? So and getting that feedback was actually very valuable because it gave us a lot of insight why some things don't work. And I think what we're what we're really up to is improving the method. So how will it work for us as an organization? Because you, in the end, you can't push that onto your colleagues and, and say from ourselves with the methods that we use, this is what we should be doing from now on. It's adapting it and having that iterative way towards something that does work within what we're doing. I think that's. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, I think one powerful way is if you can measure it, you can understand it and therefore impact it. Um, so the, the metrics question is kind of an important one as well. But I think it's a really interesting point as well in that as service designers, we generally work uh, on a project by project basis. So how do we consider the long term, as you say? So I think there's something then that needs to happen, and we don't have the answer, if we're being honest, but around having a communication between. I guess the buyer and the seller of a service in the longevity, right? How can we embed the right metrics and can we actually create a relationship that is sustainable um, and return to measure that? So as an example, we are currently working with a client on that very point where we're developing their sustainable strategy with the metrics framework in the, in the background and then coming in to audit them afterwards. But beyond that, I've personally not seen anything that's uh, very revolutionary in creating that accountability in the long term, beyond long term value framework with the, the metrics that are reported. Thank you. Guys, I think <laughs> So catch them and ask your questions. We need, sorry, to cut off. <laughs> because we need to, we want to give you 10 minutes break before the next panel starts. And little request, if you can sit as close as possible to the center, because there are more people coming in, uh, they're fluctuating around. So please, can you stick to the center as much as possible so it's easier for late comers to join, yes? Well, 10 minutes and we'll be back with the panel. Thank you, guys.